This is a Scream Queen production. Hello, friends. Welcome to your March bonus episode in the month of March. I am not even just in the month of March, but on the first day of March. It is March 1st as I'm sitting down to record this. Um, so, yeah, I'm feeling pretty fancy at the moment. Um, March 1st means that a full length episode of So Dead came out today as well, and this one was about the Lake Michigan Triangle. Yes, just like the Bermuda Triangle, only in Michigan. The fact that we have our very own triangle here in Michigan probably came as a surprise to some of you. But what if I told you that we also had our own Titanic? Because we totally did. Her name was the Lady Elgin. The P.S. Lady Elgin was built in Buffalo, New York in 1851 as a luxury passenger liner to cater to the Midwest elite on the Great Lakes. Lady Elgin was a 1,000 ton, 252 foot sidewide, sidewide, side wheel steamboat. Sorry, that was a lot of S's all at once. Um, which means there were two large paddle wheels on either side of the ship that were propelled by a steam engine. To put the size in America terms, uh, a football field is 360 feet long. Lady Elgin was 252 feet long, so Lady Elgin was roughly three quarters the length of a football field. That's pretty fucking big. The ship was outfitted with saloons, ballrooms, fine dining halls, and staterooms. It was like a mini Titanic before Titanic was a thing. In 1860, there was some weird shit going on in Wisconsin. The abolition of slavery was being hotly contested, and the Civil War was on the very near horizon. Wisconsin, like most northern states, was very anti-slavery, which was good. They were so anti-slavery, though, that the governor was trying to push through legislation that would allow them to declare war on the federal government if the president didn't sign a bill to abolish slavery. Yeah, so Wisconsin was literally trying to start a war with the entire United States. One group that was not on board with this wackadoo idea was Milwaukee's Irish Union Guard, a local militia, which militia meant something very different in the 1800s than it does today. These were not, you know, radicalists or terrorists. They were a recognized militarized group. And while they absolutely supported the abolition of slavery, they were not willing to declare war on the entire U.S. of A. to try to make it happen. Wisconsin's governor was not happy with this decision, so he legally disbanded the organization and he stripped them of their weapons. And the Union Guard was like, uh, you can't do that, and we certainly cannot be unarmed sitting ducks when shit pops off and you wackos declare war on the entire country. So the group began to reorganize and rearm themselves. But to do that, they needed money. So as a fundraiser, they chartered the Lady Elgin for a day trip to Chicago. They would sell tickets to an upscale party on Lake Michigan, then a day of adventuring in Chicago. Some reports have falsely claimed that they were going to Chicago to see presidential candidate Stephen Douglas speak. Um, but Douglas wasn't even in Chicago that day, so that was, that was not the goal. Many tickets were sold for the Union Guard's Chicago trip, but as the date of the event approached, there were still quite a few tickets left. 
not wanting them to go to waste, the Union Guard first slashed the prices, um, and then they still had some left, like the day the ship was setting sail, and they ended up just handing those out to people. Um, you know, hey, want to come to Chicago with us? Here's a free ticket, just to get rid of all the tickets, fill the ship. And the thought kind of being, even though they weren't going to make money from the sale of the ticket itself, these people that got free tickets would come on board and they would buy drinks and they would buy food and they could make some money that way. So on September 7th, 1860, hundreds of Milwaukeeans, and I'm sure that's not what they're called, but that's what we're calling them today, boarded the Lady Elgin in the early morning hours. Very, very, very early morning hours bound for Chicago. They were dressed to the nines, the Union Guard was in uniform, and the party started before the boat even pulled away from the shore. They arrived in Chicago at dawn. So again, when I say they left in the early morning hours, like it was very early. It was like middle of the night early. They spent the day adventuring, going to parades. Some of them stayed on the ship and just drank and drank and drank. A fabulous day was had by all. And then at around 11 p.m., it was time to set sail for home. The captain was leery about the return trip as a storm was a brewing out on Lake Michigan, but he was convinced to set sail anyway. Reed, he was probably threatened by the, you know, armed Union Guard that had rented the ship. So on a dark and stormy night, Lady Elgin departed Chicago bound for Milwaukee. It's unclear how many people were on the ship for a couple of reasons, one being that the way they were just kind of giving away tickets at the last minute didn't allow for them to keep track of everyone being added to the passenger roster, another being that the ship's manifesto with the list of passengers that they did know about would soon go missing. But it's estimated that there were right around 400 people on board. Some of them danced, some of them hung out in the saloon, and some of them went to their staterooms and slept for the ride home because it had been a very, very, very long day. By 2.30 a.m. on September 8th, Lady Elgin passed the city of Point Clinton, Illinois, which was almost the halfway point between Chicago and Milwaukee, but still a bit closer on the Chicago side. They were 10 miles from the shoreline, battling gale force winds and rogue waves in the pitch black night. As a particularly violent wave swelled and rushed toward them, they noticed that the wave had scooped up a 129-foot schooner called Augusta, which was hauling lumber to Chicago. The Augusta was hurled into the Lady Elgin by the storm. Augusta was much smaller than Lady Elgin, about half the size, so the captain of the Augusta was like, well, shit, they're probably fine. We're the ones that are about to sink. And so he booked it to shore um, to try to save his ship and his crew. He was unable to see in the dark that they had torn a massive hole in the Lady Elgin's port side, or to us basic folk, the left side. Um, So as the Augusta headed for safety, the Lady Elgin began taking on water quickly. Now, while I've been making Titanic comparisons most of this episode, there is no comparison in how the ships went down. The Lady Elgin was at the bottom of Lake Michigan within about 20 minutes, so it happened fast, and the fact that they were only 10 miles offshore didn't matter. There wasn't time for anyone to get to them. There were four lifeboats on the ship. When they hit the water, one immediately flipped upside down and sank, One had a massive leak and began to take on water, and the other two were partially loaded and sent on their way. The captain ordered all of the livestock. There were like 70 live cows on the ship for some reason. I don't know why they took 70 cows to a party in Chicago. Uh, Maybe they bought them in Chicago and were taking them home. I don't know. Um, But there were 70 cows on the ship. They threw all the cows overboard. Um, They threw all the cargo overboard. They pushed all the heavy shit to the starboard side of the ship um, to try to kind of flip it up the other way and get that hole up above the water level to slow down the sinking process. It didn't. Hundreds of people went into the dark waters of Lake Michigan as Lady Elgin plunged toward the lake bottom. Now, again, very unlike Titanic, Lake Michigan is never warmer than at the end of summer, which this was. It was the beginning of September. So while I'm sure the water was cold, it was not Atlantic Ocean in April cold. And there were no sharks, so that was a bonus. There was no locking the third-class passengers in the basement. Um, Most of Lady Elgin's passengers hit the water 
alive that night. Passengers clung to floating debris as the current carried them back south, fighting against the waves and rain for over five hours as they drifted toward the city of Winnetka, Illinois. And then those clinging to doors, furniture, pianos began to arrive, and that's when the true horror began. As we all know, waves are kind of the most treacherous as they near the shore. That's where they break. That's why they're called breakers. So within sight of the shoreline, all of these people who have literally been fighting for their lives for hours and are so exhausted they can barely move, start hitting these violent crashing waves and their flotation devices start breaking apart and the people just start disappearing drowning right as help is within reach. By this time, six plus hours after the Lady Elgin sank, word had begun to spread about what happened, and help came in the form of Good Samaritans. One of those Samaritans, a 17-year-old college student by the name of Edward Spencer, went into the water attached to a long rope over and over and over, rescuing 17 people from the water. His actions left him so injured that he was permanently disabled, he dropped out of college, and he was never the same again. But when he was asked later in life if he would do it again knowing the toll that it would take on him, he said that he would not change his actions that day. Somewhere in the ballpark of 400 people went into Lake Michigan when Lady Elgin sank. Most of them were alive. 96 survived. Only 8 of those survivors were women. Women were not encouraged to swim back in those days, so most of them didn't know how. They were also wearing party dresses and petticoats and corsets, which weighted them down like lead and made it very difficult to move about in the water. To this day, the sinking of the Lady Elgin remains the worst loss of life disaster on the Great Lakes. So there it is, Michigan's own Titanic-sized tragedy. Wild, right? I didn't, like, I'd heard about it, but I didn't, like, know, know about it. That's crazy. This concludes your March bonus episode. I will see you soon, either with a new full-size episode or mini-sode, depending on when you're listening to this. And then your April bonus episode will be coming to you in April. <laughs> Until then, keep shining, you magnificent what-the-fucks.